is my great pleasure uh, to chair this uh, keynote address on reflections on double agent strategies in dealing in virtue and our later research tra trajectory. Um, I don't need to introduce the participants <laughs> to this panel. Uh, professor Brian Garth is, is Chancellor's Professor of Law at the University of California, Irvine. And uh, Professor Yves Dozalé is uh, Director de Recherche Emérite uh, at the CNRS in Paris. Uh, thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause. To our Okay, I'm going to start, and I want to really, uh, I'm, we're honored to be here and to have so many enthusiastic people uh, in the audience, and, uh, and it's intimidating to follow a session that's already introduced the book and its ideas and, uh, you know, sort of put pressure on us to, uh, to, to follow that up. And what we're going to do, at, because this was, a, this was the beginning of our collaboration, what we're going to do is talk about dealing in virtue in part, but also try to use it as a way to explain what's going on in our uh, subsequent career and how that relates back to dealing in virtue. So the way that we're going to proceed is I'm going to start with a few kind of idiosyncratic notes on dealing in virtue. Then Eve is going to develop the relationship of that research to uh, really to our two books on palace wars and Asian legal revivals. Then I'm going to come back and, on the basis of that research, suggest that it led us to rethink some parts of our Dealing in Virtue book. And then Eve will conclude by talking about our current research and be more, I think, explicit on the, the double agency that's uh, behind a lot of this research approach. So on, on Dealing in Virtue, I want to make, uh, first of all, say that our, our approach was, in, in some sense, uh, improvised in a nice way. We started out with a, a grant to study international commercial arbitration and our idea was that we would have some kind of division of labor where I would cover one part of the world and he would, he would cover a different one and we would compare our notes and put them together. And it turned out as we started doing the research uh, jointly that that was so valuable to each of us that we ended up doing all the research jointly. And, it, and it's partly because what we could find was we each represented something different. And this is what Bourdieu pointed out and made a kind of a science out of in his introduction was I, I brought the world of, uh, of large law firms, American law, and Eve uh, could deliver the world both of, of sociology and I come from law and also the world of the, the French uh, grand professors, uh, etc. So our points of entry ended up being also a fault line in the research, a division within the world of arbitration. Second, on our interview style, as we started out, we were asking some questions, even, even at the beginning of the interview sometime, about, well, you know, tell us about international commercial arbitration. And I think it reached an all-time low when somebody told us that arbitration was the wave of the future. You can't do a, a scholarly work when somebody tells you something like that. So it turned out that we really decided, and this is partly consistent with Bourdieu and what we bring our own personal narratives, is take people through their lives you know, how they got to arbitration. And of course, when you ask that, everybody always says, quite by accident. And then of course, it's completely overdetermined once you see their careers. And what we could do is see by doing these uh, biographical interviews, we could learn who they are, what they bring to it, and how their self-representations, which were already talked about, represent so much of what capital they contain, what assets they bring what they can materialize out of their, uh, their own selves. And a third thing I want to say is that it, it, this was an easy, uh, an easy field to find. And our, our first, one of our first interviews, somebody said, and you, you already have issues of core and periphery, you already have uh, issues of technocrats and grand old men, basically described the top arbitrators and then said, and there's another generation, there are more, you know, they're more uh, efficient, more technocratic, and probably used the term even already in an early interview, mafia, grand old men. And you know, then proceeded to name arbitrators that we were writing down and misspelling, but we learned them all later on. And part of what they said was, there are all these Swiss arbitrators, there are all these French, there are all these British QCs and retired judges, and then there's 
there's you know there's two in Cairo there's one and you could see you know this this whole issue of you know gender and race that already has been talked about the third thing is that uh, we use the word transnational legal order in the book title but I think that the theme of the book is that these are domestic stories domestic capital competing and making up the rules of a game that are evolving in a transnational setting and I interesting a couple of interesting footnotes about the book. One is that it, one of the first reviewers, and when we were starting to do our work, Richard Abel of UCLA was always a reviewer of our work. And he said, uh, the chapters on, uh, on Egypt and Hong Kong should just be thrown out of the book. Because uh, to learn about arbitration, it, you need to study how it works. You study where it's successful, not where it's failure. And for us, obviously, uh, we prevailed on that, that it was about the processes, the global processes, the imperial processes, the hegemonic processes, and the like. So we kept it in. Then I also want to point out we had two chapters in the book that were not reviewed, that we, that we basically threw out and never published, even though they were kind of interesting, because we just ran out of words that we could put. One of them was on, uh, on academic scholarship. And we basically took five or six pieces of scholarship this esoteric uh, arbitration scholarship, and, and we uh, deconstructed them and saw that essentially what arbitration scholarship is advertisements for myself. You know, the, the problem with arbitration is this, and if you had more representation of this idea, this perspective, then it would be much more legitimate and better. And it, lo and behold, that's what the writer happens to represent. So it was a nice chapter. Then the other chapter that we left out was on conferences. Because one of the things we first heard early on was someone said, if I see a conference on international commercial arbitration, and I don't know the people, it's an unimportant conference. You know, these are not people that count. And so we went through all the conferences of a couple of years, and we counted up you know, who presented, who, who didn't. And we had a nice sort of account of the, of the role of conferences in in legitimating, producing, explaining the hierarchies, building careers, because what you, it, what you have to explain is why were there more conferences than there were arbitrations in a certain way. It's because if you're on the periphery, you have a, a conference, you invite some people from the core, and you try to get them to say, to, to bring you in, you know, as a way. So, so you end up both legitimating the core people because you've brought them out and shown how important they are, and you build a little spot, spot for yourself. And so that, we saw that as well. Then I, want, I only want to go just a few minutes, but the other is uh, uh, two other things. I wanted to just say one, one sort of surprising thing to me for people who study international law out of our interviews was I had taught international law and I had read about these great petroleum arbitrations, you know, Ammon Oil, Libya, and the like. And when we went and tr traced those, it was so interesting that these were, it was dirty oil and ammonia. Basically, we found, and coming from the US where they claim bargaining in the shadow of the law, that these arbitrations had nothing to do with anything about those disputes. They were just sideshows that no one paid much attention to, but they invested so much, they allowed the lawyers to just play their game. You know, to, to you know, go arbitrate on this little piece of the ammon oil issue, write up your grand principles, and it turned out that the, that equipment of producing those grand principles, even though they had nothing to do with the outcomes of those, those oil nationalizations, had something to do with building the kinds of principles that could be used and legitimated because they, they sort of used a kind of a Lex Mercatoria type approach. And now Eve's going to talk about really the trajectory of our, our next research, but I want to say one other thing, it's sort of by way of anecdote, which is after we did the arbitration research, we, were, uh, we kind of encouraged ourselves, partly in response to some criticisms, to, to, to take the other side, go do some research on international human rights, and do the same thing about the construction of the field of international human rights. So we did about 15 interviews on that with a lot of the leaders of the field, and this will sound a little bit cynical, but it was the same story. So we decided that that was too easy to write the same story about kind of hobbyists, you know, the evolving, you know, being used at a certain point when there's a kind of a crisis to pr draw on those resources, those, uh, that kind of legitimated academic dis discourse that serves power at a particular moment. So we didn't write that book, although we did 
write about human rights in some of our later research. But uh, it would have been too easy, but it would have been interesting nevertheless. Okay, your turn. Okay, my, my task will be to take you now away, but only for a short pe period from arbitration and b before bringing you back to arbitration. And I was struck in learning this morning that many people found our work sexy, because <laughs> how can we make a grand old man sexy? Especially if you have very few female, young female, preferably around. <laughs> and I think that's probably one of the reasons why many of our uh, fellow scholars said, your book is interesting, basically, it doesn't interest us, because you're not talking about what does really matter for us, advocacy, public interest, law, uh, gender, all these kind of uh, fancy things. And that I would have another answer, which uh, Brandt alluded to uh, in, uh, when he talked about uh, our, the preface written by Bourdieu. He said, you know, if you want to make a story sexy, you have to, write, to try to write it or to study it like John Le Carré or better Boss or House of Cards or something like that. And, you know, you have, and Bourdieu exactly wrote that, he said, you have to be a double agent in order to study double agent. Mm -hmm. And suddenly all sorts of things that become much more uh, visible when you do that. So our first agenda was indeed to look at human rights, but not just as human rights, but say, a uh, an argument that was developed again and again by people like Bois Santos and others was to say, you know, you have two hemispheres, you know, you have the regulatory justice and you have the emancipatory justice, and those are totally different animals, and they are completely separate, and it's, uh, so our game, or our challenge, was to try to show that maybe uh, you could construct or analyze this different terrain with a different perspective showing that maybe there was some links between the two. And uh, on that aspect, we were relatively lucky in the sense that our first terrain was Latin America. And if you look at Latin America, you have on the one hand Pinochet and his Chicago boys, and you have on the other hand people defending the victims of uh, Pinochet uh, for amnesty. And, the, and you have this constant fighting between Chicago uh, and Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. So you see that uh, the reality is more complex. And of course, this reality is complex because the US itself is constructed. People are always talking about the state, the return of the state. But the American state is a very different animal from the Bismarck and per Prussian state. And one of the characteristics of the US state is that particularly at the time after the uh, Cold War and the Vietnam War, the US were exporting its internal warfare between the Oaks and the um, uh, Dose. And it's precisely this exportation of internal conflicts which was very much at the core of American hegemony and even at the sort of uh, effect of mimetism where exactly the same strategy we are being used both in the North and in the South to construct something that could be the remaking, the restructuring of the state. And I will go briefly on that because I don't have the time to develop it. But so this was basically the core. You, you, we are still in the uh, old dividing line that I, we described between American lawyers on the one hand and grand old professor from the continental, uh, continental Europe. But suddenly we see it from a very different and more complex and more historical perspective. Uh, lo uh, politicians were trained in law, coming from elite families, uh, with doctorates from uh, all sorts of uh, European countries. And suddenly, they found themselves replaced by either military colonels and b or by uh, American PhD in economics uh, from the US. So it was you no know, completely shift. So now I want to focus very briefly on the second aspect of the book. We were extraordinarily lucky in finding a sort of research strategy, methodology that was very much suited to the type, type of object that we were doing. And you know, if you're lucky, you can just continue. So it's exactly the same strategy that tried to 
prolonged by looking at uh, uh, Asian countries and colonization and things like that. And there I want to point out something that will be you know, useful for our discussion later, is we are always talking about colonies, law, uh, the process of law, the, and what is striking when you look at the history of law in uh, Asian countries, you find three steps. You find uh, the first step where colonial societies invest corrupt elite lawyers from the periphery to dress them as sort of auxiliary for their administration. And of course, these persons are twice lucky because when the uh, independence arrives, they suddenly say, oh, but I'm not just a lawyer, I'm the father of independence, I'm the champion of the nation. So uh, please come to me and uh, it's a story where everybody uh, awakes as a, as a lawyer, as a lawyer politician. And what happens after that is exactly always the same story. That means uh, when these people are in control of both the politics, the judiciary, the administration, they abuse it. They abuse it, of course, because they have to serve the uh, needs and the, of their clientele, of the oligarchy, of the merchants who have paid for their studies. And suddenly, the legal capital, the legal credibility of law diminishes rapidly, especially if you are in the context of Cold War, where suddenly, uh, the, uh, especially the Americans say, we don't care with this uh, legal judicial battles or parliamentary battles. We went to have law and order. That means commons plus a few uh, economics, economists to uh, deal with this uh, situation. And this produced a third stage, which is what we call revival. That means suddenly the credibility of the law is so so, so, so low, <laughs> sorry for the, uh, that, uh, as one of our uh, friends described, uh, Lev, uh, the credibility of uh, the judiciary in Indonesia was so bad that the only thing to do was to get rid of all the lawyers, absolutely all of them. And he was a great uh, friend of uh, most of these people that he had trained. But, so, but that still means that something needs to be reinvented. And to know what has been uh, reinvented, we go uh, this time back to the first type of colon colon decolonization, the US. And the US where, again, the exportation of lawyers made suddenly this uh, the US uh, a, a country run by and for lawyers. But very quickly again, these people lost uh, every uh, consideration. And uh, it was the Jackson era. And there was a need for the reinvention of law by importing something which had disappeared from the UK. That means law schools and uh, regular curriculum, the Socratic method, and so on and so on. And there again, we find three steps that I will uh, describe very briefly because it leads to our second part of the story, which is these gentlemen lawyers who were in fact arrogant working for Robert Barons had to recreate their own credibility by reinvesting in the law, not just in the law schools, but also in legal politics. And that's where they became, uh, they were, uh, recruited by, uh, to, to become uh, a representative of uh, the, colon the anti-colonial colonia colonization of the Philippines, when the lawyers were uh, recruited from the anti-colonial league to serve as colonial proconsul, uh, people like Judge Taft. And the third sta stage is also very interesting for two reasons, because this strategy of reconverting was incredibly successful. Can you imagine somebody like Judge Taft, who was both the president of the US and the chief Supreme Court at the same time, and uh, or people like Elihu Root, who got the uh, Nobel Prize for reinventing or refinancing uh, international law out of the Carnegie uh, uh, philanthropy. And so at the same time as law and the US 
kind of state was deeply restructured in the US around what is called the foreign policy establishment. And we will talk later about that. But it's also, at the same time, when we see these people who were, you know, re I re repeat, uh, hide guns working in the colonies, reinventing themselves as uh, 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 Secretary of State or uh, statesmen, becoming the grandfathers of international law. So that's your... Okay, uh, when, we, when we did the arbitration book, it, it was sort of presented as if it, it started with uh, the hobbyists, kind of people who had a kind of fascination with, uh, with arbitration around the International Chamber of Commerce, and then circumstances, which I won't repeat, kind of led to this, you know, take off in the 70s and more in the 1980s of turning hobbyists into, you know, a successful, you know, arbitration venture that took off. But when we started doing this research, and it, it, when we started studying you know, the Philippines in particular, you saw all these names that are the names associated with the big US famous corporate lawyer statespersons. You know, they are the most respected in history of the legal profession. So, and they invested, as Eve said, in international law and in professionalizing international law and in, in creating the American Society of International Law. Uh, in, in, in international courts in the permanent court of arbitration, in arbitration. And th the key point is, when we started looking at them in relation to uh, arbitration, th the key was that they linked themselves and the economic power that they represented, which is also embodied in philanthropy, the, the Carnegie Foundation, they, in order for their own career purposes, they needed some academic credibility that, came, that of course, was represented by Europe. So they form an alliance with European international law professors who are marginal, relatively marginal in their own fields. So each, you know, in their domestic struggle comes together and it's an unequal alliance because the money and the power is, is behind uh, the US uh, corporate lawyer states persons represented above all by Elihu Root and the, the kind of the academic capital that's a, a little uh, uh, lacking resources comes from Europe. And when we re-looked re at the genesis of, of the Chamber of Commerce in Paris, we found that, in fact, it was promoted by uh, New York uh, entrepreneurs, legal entrepreneurs, who got the, this foreign policy establishment, Root and others, to sign on for it. But the point of building it in Paris was to legitimate creating arbitration and the passage of the Arbitration Act in the US. And so as we started exploring, well, what are the links between this international law side and this private arbitration side, we, we started looking at the talks in The Hague, you know, over a long period of time, the, in, in the international law lectures, and found that indeed, over a relatively long period of time, both sides were being developed um, in tandem. And even though the, the international law and internationalism as a project was marginal between the, the World War I and World War II, it was still keeping alive in these doctrinal lectures and all. So the point was that the economic law and the international law uh, were not so separate. You know, it wasn't just the arbitration world, but this world of grand international law was also there. And what that also tells you is that US corporate lawyers and European professors are not just an, a strategic alliance that worked well in the, in, the inter, in the economic law side, it's also really behind the, the structure of international law as it emerged over the 40s and 50s. So not surprisingly, you know, you look again and you start to see there are, little, there are more connections between international law, public international law, and this private economic side than we probably first, you know, noticed in the arbitration book. And that's quite relevant today. And, and Sarah Desilet, who is here, has done research that shows that with the criticisms of investment arbitration, two things have happened. One is that there is a little more frequent conversion of this international public law capital into the private capital of international commercial arbitration to try to sort of shift a little bit of the discussion and shift some of the people so that their center of power is more open to uh, the more public law principles. And the other is that this plays into, which is always part of the story, is the US corporate law firms behind, behind the story. It also gives them another tool so that they can 
play different forms, but not only the different forms in arbitration, but they begin to be experts in playing public international law strategies as well on behalf of their, their clients um, and themselves. So the theme of this is just that, uh, you know, we added, and it's still important to the project, both of international commercial arbitration and the U.S. Uh, uh, and inter international law generally, that it, it relates to a project that um, from the start involve this U.S. corporate elite on behalf of their clients and themselves and getting some, some detachment from their clients, some reputation for them for their statesmanlike behavior, but also representing their clients. So, go ahead. Thank you. So, in this last chapter, small chapter, we're not going to tell you stories, uh, because first you don't have enough time to tell these stories, but try to uh, take a more difficult approach, which uh, comes from uh, Bourdieu and a few others, but also from what Subramanian called interconnected histories. And of course, this means that uh, you have to go a long way to the back, going back to the genesis of law in the 13th, 14th century, and see how, how that has evolved differently to construct what is frequently called or misnamed as transnational, with, when in fact it's much more a competition between not just national spaces, national ways of doing law, practicing law, producing law, reproducing law, and while you have this contradiction still alive today, which has its roots both in the ambiguity of the American model, as I alluded to earlier, but also explains why in the so-called North-South divide, to go very rapidly, you deal with completely different topics, and frequently you have also the tendency to do mistranslation. So I'm going to organize this uh, presentation, again, very briefly around four topics. One is uh, derived from Bourdieu, his uh, big uh, book on sur l'état, uh, on the state, where Bourdieu says, you cannot study law if you don't start with the idea that law is very much totally embedded into the state, or more precisely, in or within competing fields of state power. And lawyers are basically, and from the beginning, they were and are still brokers between different rulers, different institutions. You know, of course, the first one was the church and the kings, uh, but you have also the oligarchy and the, or the plutocracy. And, the, and lawyers are not just brokers between different territories, to use uh, the word of Seth uh, Kessasson, but in remaking territories, that means in remaking regime, in moving sense, that is what uh, Berman called the law and revolution. And you have many of these law and revolution episodes. So uh, this is my first point. Of course, in this uh, fight, in and around the state, lawyers enjoy very different resources. Some are basically civil servants, civil officers of the king, working as a kind of meritocracy for the king's bureaucracy, or other kinds of bureaucracy, condottieri or the uh, colonels. But they are, can also be coming from a sort of legal aristocracy. That means people who inherit the right of justice from the beginning, because that was in their genes, it was part of the manorial justice, and it's something that uh, has never been challenged. Why? And I will now put my second point, which I'll call a business model for reproducing elite lawyers. And the recipe is relatively easy, it's given by very great books that I do recommend, like uh, Brundage and Martinez, and also it's focusing very much on the uh, Renaissance period, but you can very easily find uh, adaptation still now. Uh, and the basic recipe is you use social capital and financial capital, preferably you inherit social capital and so uh, financial capital from the uh, oligarchy or from the uh, bishop that uh, is your illegitimate father. 
The second part of that is you transform, you invest this financial capital in very costly, incredibly costly legal education. Now at that time, you had to sell several villages to buy your own books. And it's almost the same as the cost of the uh, <laughs> fees in the elite uh, law schools of the US. So that's the second step. And uh, this education is also <laughs> claims to be universal because it's both canon law and Roman law, or it's both uh, common law and civil law, or, or it can be international law. And now we come to the next stage after all this heavy investment. You recoup your gains first by working as a broker, as a diplomat, between competing uh, uh, warlords, uh, condottieri, uh, church, uh, and through that you accumulate relational capital. You gain the trust of rulers, important rulers. And then, you know, you've got the jackpot. That means uh, you can employ, uh, you can practice uh, very handsomely as law full-time lawyers, both working as a judge, but also working as a professor and reproducing the next generation. So this is basically the, the business model for reproducing law and lawyers and their legitimacy all over the world. I, again, I cannot give you examples, but it's... Yet, what I want to point out is the third, and this is my third point, this general model has also some uh, variations that means, as in any good recipe, you can put more salt or more pepper, and you can either substitute financial capital if you are willing to buy your doctorate, or uh, meritocratic capital if you feel that you have enough talent to acquire a respectable degree. And there is always the competition between those who inherit their low degree as Bourdieu used to call a degree of bourgeoisie. That means, by the definition, once you were part of this ruling elite, uh, aristocratic elite, you had the right to step into the law. Uh, uh, on the, the and you have also the other group, which, is, uh, which has less credentials and therefore have to work harder for many reasons, like being Jewish immigre in the US post-war. That was a so difficult uh, situation. But this tension, which is also a complementarity which we find again in dealing with virtue, is something that has long, long lasting effects. Why? Because if you are the uh, uh, successful high judge or eminent barrister, you're going to try to keep the business in the family, <laughs> preferably to your sons or nephews. But if you have to go through this, you can choose for some uh, eminent and, uh, 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 woman to, to uh, take over this capital. And the result of that is that you have what economists call a sort of progressive uh, obsolescence uh, phenomenon in legal education. You know, why should you bother to spend your time learning boring uh, topics on the law schools when you can buy your law degree uh, for a relatively cheap price? And so you see over and over again a process where the value of the law degree, the law legal knowledge, gets more or less uh, uh, diminishes rapidly. And of course, in some cases, like with the uh, long revolution, it can be much more dramatic, because uh, the, when the um, uh, landed gentry, uh, who were the uh, common law barristers, made an alliance with the, uh, the landed gentry and the merchant class, and they won over the kings, their first uh, decision, more or less, was to say, let's get rid of the law universities, Cambridge, Oxford, finished. And the uh, inns of court are no longer anything but a sort of symbolical uh, place where people can recruit uh, their protégé, uh, preferably coming from the same milieu. And this is a process that has continued 
again and again until, of course, it was difficult to export it either to Australia or New Zealand because it was too far away. And therefore, there was something different. And this something different is what we see in the US when, again, for the same reasons, the value of legal education diminishes and you have necessity to recreate something. And this recreation is what the birth of the law school, but you know, schools which were at that time mainly teaching schools, where of course those who had the uh, prestige to state the law were not the law professors, but the high judge and the, the, the alliance of high judge and law professors. But so this starts something which is at sort of double angle. On the one hand, you find that this, you, again and again, a new cadre of meritocratic, marginal law professor wanting to be recognized are going to reinvest in the law, but not alone. They're going to reinvest in the law by making an alliance with the new rulers, the Protestant princes, or Bismarck, or New Deal and uh, Roosevelt, or the French Revolutionary uh, from the Third Revolution. So you have always this competition between those who are going to produce law on behalf of the new regime, and another version which is incredibly more successful, in also, which is very much a US invention, where they say it's not enough to invest into law as a form of knowledge, you have to invest into the ideal of the law. That's a, uh, and a, a, the ideal of the law is indeed the birth of advocacy, public interest law, and all these new approaches of, of the law, which are constantly being uh, promoted, or should I say, subsidized by philanthropic foundations such as Ford. And so you, know, you have always, and still you have, this sort of battle line who say it should be law as politics and law with politics, or law as sort of political ideals, professional ideals. And of course, that's why I tend to think that uh, uh, this vision of the transnational as some, uh, some sort of uh, uh, neutral space where everybody can work together at the end, pretend to do the same thing, is still nonsense because you still have this very strong uh, tendency, structural tendency, which are at work there and which can be manifested in the fight for law schools, for legal practice, and so on. And it's also, it leads me to maybe challenge another of the sacred cows, so I apologize to the uh, uh, peer. <laughs> Because not only I think it's necessary to deconstruct the transnational, it's also necessary to be uh, cautious with the uh, looking in a too uh, positivist way at advocacy as something which is rise from the bottom out of nowhere and is going to pr produce public good because advocacy is also part very much of the exporting of US hegemony as a kind of moral imperialism. Thank you.